when you normally start off talking about climate change and digitalization, but particularly climate change, you get one of these amazing graphics up here where you get some very, very clever scientist who starts pointing at all these lines and then you leave the meeting and you say, wow, that was really interesting, but you have very little idea exactly what was going on. So I'm not going to explain it either because I'm not sure too. But one thing I do know is that climate change is probably the most urgent environmental crisis that the world is facing at this very moment. The United Nations Scientific Panel, the IPCC, tells us we've got maybe nine years to get on track to actually get on board to actually reduce our emissions by 2050 in line with the Paris Agreement. And there's a key moment coming, which is 2030, which again is just 10 years away, when we need to halve our emissions if we're going to have a carbon-safe, climate-safe chance in the future for ourselves and literally billions of people, including our children. So it's not a marginal topic. The question is, can digitalization help us in this very short time that we have to actually exponentially reduce our emissions over the coming years? 2020 was meant to be an absolutely critical year. It was called the super year for climate change. This is because in 2020, the United Kingdom in Glasgow was going to host the UN Climate Conference five years after the landmark Paris Climate Change Agreement. And this was the year when all the governments were supposed to come to Scotland and they were going to increase their ambition to fight climate change. Interestingly enough, in the Paris Agreement of 2015, the national climate action plans of nations were almost silent on the issue of digitalization. And I think it's the hope of many people that when they convene again, because COVID-19, of course, has interfered with plans slightly, when they convene next year in Glasgow, that digitalization will be on the agenda of the governments when they make their decisions to raise their ambition. I think you're a very smart audience. I think you know what we need to fight climate change here and now, and we've got some really good things that are moving. We know we need more of these things, right? Renewable energy, absolutely fantastic. They can help us win this race to zero, and in a sense, they're already doing it. We need a lot more of these as well, solar panels. We all know this. And in fact, actually, the story of renewable energy is one of the great stories of the climate change story, because right now we are getting exponential growth in renewable energy in all parts of the world, where once we would say to people in Africa, you must have wind power, and they would say, you Europeans, how can you possibly say that? Uh, you want to give us windmills when you've got nuclear power and coal-fired power stations. Now we can all stand together and say, the world is moving on the issue of renewable energy. I also think that we need to move a little bit faster on this area of technology, our oceans. We've hardly touched the possibility and the potential to generate clean energy from our oceans. And in fact, by one assessment, if we actually fully harvested the power of our seas and our oceans, we could generate 20,000 to 80,000 terawatt hours of electricity. To put that in context, that's more than the world's current energy consumption, if we could actually do this with our oceans. Uh, we're going to have to eat a few less of these as well if we're going to deal with climate change because our cows and our pigs and our chickens, but particularly our cows, are unfortunately playing a big role in what is happening here. Right now, as we sit here in Bonn, or stand here in Bonn, we know that the Amazon is again on fire, in part because its ability to function as a forest, its health, is being affected by climate change, but also by deforestation, which is contributing to climate change, often for the food that is being used to be grown for feeding more and more cattle. And perhaps we need to reflect on this a little bit as individuals. The UK just had their climate assembly of citizens chosen at random from their population, and one of the things came out clearly, even from people that fly aircraft, was we need to spend more money, we need to be taxed more heavily for short-haul aviation. Because this lovely cartoon from Megan Herbert, who's an Australian cartoonist illustrator, I think brings home how some of the cheap and cheerful things we do have a very long consequence down the generations. We're also going to have to get rid of some of these. Uh, I'm not talking about Angela Merkel. Uh, I'm actually talking about the SUV behind Angela Merkel, although I do un understand Angela Merkel is going, I think, next year. So maybe we could get rid of SUVs next year as well, all around the world. 
Um, and we're going to have to have a lot more of these. These are electric vehicles. Now, I know there's a lot of Germans in the audience, and that might be a bit of a shock to the system to have to start driving electric milk floats instead of your BMWs and your Mercedes. So maybe your Mercedes, your BMWs, and your Teslas need to look obviously more like that. So we need a lot of that too. So a lot of good things are happening. It's really great. And you might say, well, fine, what are we worried about? But we're worried about things like this. We're not particularly worried about the telecom building, but we are worried about buildings. I'm sure this building is very energy efficient. But 40% of the places where we live and work, or should I put it another way, 40% of the carbon emissions are coming from our buildings, the places where we are living in all the time. And yet, the floor space, so in other words, the number of buildings in the world or the size of the building, is going to double over the next 30 to 40 years. If we can't do something about this, then all the other good stuff for renewables is going to be more and more challenging in terms of succeeding in the next nine years, by the way. Just remember, the next nine years. So can digitalization come to the rescue? Can it be the silver bullet? Can it help us? Can it deliver that exponential growth? This is the exponential roadmap. This is from a lot of brilliant scientists, including the Potsdam Institute in, in, in near Berlin, uh, and the Stockholm Resilience Center in, in Sweden, and many, many more. Future Earth, that's another organization connected with this, many, many people behind this. They have 36 solutions to halve emissions by 2030. The question is, can any of these 36 viable solutions happen without digitalization? And the answer is clearly no. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of examples where digitalization is coming that could indeed deal with the problems, even in the short term, if only governments, particularly meeting next year in Glasgow, can bite the bullet and scale them up. Let's have a look at a few. So, this is very familiar to some people, of course. Now, you know, actually renting cars, right, uh, with their mobile phones. This is digitalization. It's still not that common across the entire world, but it's a recent development which is really shifting to a new concept of what it means to drive a motor car. It's about not owning a car. It's about car usage. If you combine that with public transport and cycling and all the other good things, walking, maybe you have an integrated transport system, as the experts like to say, but maybe you are transforming a concept of not owning things anymore, but just using things. And all the emissions that go with making things change, and also the usage of those things themselves. The exponential roadmap says that 95% of the time of a car is spent not going anywhere. That means a huge amount of emissions from making motor cars that don't go anywhere. That seems a bit stupid, doesn't it? I don't know. It seems stupid to me. And they suggest that if usage was the principal force behind the manufacture of motor cars, then, and this sounds incredible to me, and, but I've cross-checked it several times, that the fleet of cars in the world would just be 3% of what they are today. That would be over 90% of the cars taken off the road because nobody would be buying them to own them. They would be just using them, using their smartphones in cities that have this kind of system. This looks very familiar now, doesn't it? Hey, we're all sitting around on Zoom, having a good chat. Uh, I mean, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time. I'm sure a lot of people here uh, in, in the audience and outside have been doing this for a while. But for many people, it has been quite a novelty to sign up to Zoom. And this has been a great part of the digital revolution coming to so many people. But what does it also mean in terms of emissions? Well, according to the exponential roadmap, we would basically cut business. Uh, flights by aircraft and the emissions by about 50% if we did a hell of a lot more of this, hopefully when COVID-19 is gone. And co-working hubs. I've always loved the idea of co-working hubs. I've loved the idea of villages having their town hall as a digital co-working hub where you don't have to travel and commute long distances and where you can just walk the kids to school and then go into your office, which is a co-working hub. If things became more common, then the evidence from the exponential roadmap is that basically uh, emissions of up to 60% could be reduced in terms of, of, of commuting. I do some work for something called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. It's a big industry initiative to get rid of uh, plastic waste, <laughs> as it says, uh, mainly in the oceans, because that's where most of it turns up. And of course, plastic is made from, uh, from, uh, from oil, which contributes to climate change. Can digital technologies help with this? 
issue? Well, certainly it, now it's growing. In Southeast Asia, for example, they've got drones with artificial intelligence cameras that can tell you if a big mass of something sitting on a riverbank is mud or is plastic. And then these drones send a signal back to the local authority or whoever is responsible so they can get there before the heavy rains come and wash those plastics into the river system and out to the sea. There's also new systems uh, coming along through digitalization, which is allowing some of the poorest people in the world, the waste pickers of some of our developing countries, who get on their mobile phone a signal that there is a company over there wants to recycle this kind of plastic right now and will pay a good price. And so they're making more money and not wasting their time collecting plastics that nobody wants. It's helping them and their families and their lives. Another good side of digitalization. The Smarter 2030 report, and Deutsche Telekom had a hand in this with many, many uh, telecoms companies, looked at the whole issue of you know, digitalization about, I suppose, three or four years ago. They said that, for example, if we could link weather forecasting to mobile phones of farmers, particularly in developing countries, where they got up-to-date weather forecasts through digitalization, this could boost yields of agriculture, food, by 30%, reducing the pressure on cutting down our forests. And the UN Environment Program, another great thinker in this area, has looked at buildings. Do you know that most steel in buildings, that we, we put 20 to 30% more steel in buildings than we need when we build them? How crazy is that, right? That's a waste of steel. It's a waste of energy making steel because steel requires a lot of energy to make it, normally fossil fuels, unless, of course, the Swedes get good and use hydrogen. And apparently, with artificial intelligence, there are ways of designing out this wastage of materials in big structures but also in small ones too. Digitalization could help here as well. And of course, what about the home gadgets, right? Why do we all have television sets and why all do we have all these radios and gadgets and things like that when this baby can actually manage the entire thing? This can be your entertainment center. Why would we make all these gadgets that have emissions associated with their manufacturer and problems with their disposal when we could have something like this, which would actually change the dynamics and the emission profiles? And what about democracy? We've heard a bit about democracy. Sweden is using digitalization very constructively uh, for holding themselves as a government to account by allowing citizens to actually monitor their plan to be a carbon neutral country by 2045. But this is the rub, isn't it? Because that knife, buttering some very nice German bread with hopefully bio butter, that knife can also be doing good jobs like that, but that knife can be doing things like this, right? Pointy, sharp things can harm you. There is two sides to this equation, and the digitalization equation has two sides to it too. We know that a lot of the social media channels have algorithms. We know that we are the product. We are the product. That's why we get all these free phone calls and, and we can post all our pictures and photos, because we are the product. And these algorithms want us to know, what do we want? What do we want? They seem to want this. They're a bit curious that climate change might be bullshit. Well, let's give them more of that. Let's really tell them it's bullshit. This is creating climate skepticism, which is not helping governments and not helping society. And they are reinforcing prejudices on many fronts, but including on climate change. There are a lot of scientific papers out on this. You only have to read them. And then what about this baby? Okay, we love Amazon, right? You can get all your books you want on Amazon. It's fantastic. But are digital services like this turning us into super consumers where the footprint of humanity from overconsumption will go through the roof and the chance of dealing with climate change in the next nine years becomes ever more invisible? This is a paper from the final bit of that exponential roadmap. You can read it, but you know, artificial intelligence, other digital technologies, great potential to help us, but global sustainability, not an inevitable outcome. And so it's absolutely clear that we need the involvement of those people who understand policy to direct this revolution, which could be so beneficial and is so urgently needed within the next nine years, so it's directed in the right direction. Or we can just do this. And I'm entering now with a little... Australian comedy show, 
which tells us the alternative to what we can we do. We know this summer's devastating fires have been hard for you, but they've been hard for us too. We've been forced to accept the science, kind of. Sure, it took the country being reduced to an ashen tomb for people, homes, trees and over one billion animals. But hey, better late than never, right? Due to this catastrophe, we've decided it's time to take action. Introducing our new and updated climate policy. Get fucking used to it. Under Get Fucking Used To It, we pledge to finally acknowledge climate change is real and commit to doing jack shit about it and clearly we can't do that so let's embrace digitalization but at the same time be very careful how it's directed so we maximize its benefits thank you